Have you ever heard of the Judge Rottenberg Educational Center? Probably not. But if you have, you've heard reports about gut-wrenching tactics like shock therapy and even sensory deprivation. This institution has been accused of inhumane and cruel punishment methods on their residents. But that's not all they do there. From the many shocking deaths to the ill-conceived cover-ups that have occurred at the JRC, the story of the center's founder is one that you simply won't believe. Get ready for an eye-opening and jaw-dropping journey into the dark side of psychology and utopian centers of control. I should warn you, this story is not for the faint of heart. This is Matthew Israel, an American behavioral psychologist known for founding the Judge Rottenberg Center, a school for people with disabilities. Before I talk about the center, you should probably get inside the mind of the founder a little deeper. Matthew was born in 1933 in New York City. In 1950, he enrolled at Harvard University as a fine arts major. Oddly enough, he found traditional psychology to be difficult to grasp. He took a behaviorism class with B.F. Skinner in his freshman year in order to fulfill a science credit requirement. This is where he first encountered Skinner's novel, Walden II, which, to his surprise, had a profound influence on his life. B.F. Skinner was an American psychologist who developed the behaviors theory, which says that all human behavior can be explained by reinforcement and punishment principles. Skinner's novel, Walden II, depicts a behaviorist utopia in which residents of a commune are conditioned through the use of rewards and punishment. The book would go on to be the inspiration and framework by which Matthew dedicated his life in order to make the utopia Skinner described a reality. After graduating from Harvard in 1960, Matthew founded a company to design and market B.F. Skinner's teaching machines in the hopes of raising enough capital to establish the Walden II utopia. After several years of failure, the firm closed, but Matthew continued with his plans to build the utopia. In 1966, Matthew attended a Walden II conference where he discussed how to launch the behaviorist commune with other Walden II supporters. Matthew founded the Association of Social Design, a nonprofit organization dedicated to establishing behaviorist communities based entirely on the principles outlined in Walden II. However, Matthew's attempts to build the utopia based on Skinner's theories were unsuccessful. In 1967, his first attempt to establish a communal house in Arlington, Massachusetts, was a flop. His second attempt was also unsuccessful. Matthew believed that the experiments failed because he had too little control over the participants and that they all had the option to leave. Matthew then decided to build a school for disabled children, knowing that he would be able to practice behaviorism on them with few restrictions. After establishing the Judge Rottenberg Educational Center in 1971, he abandoned further attempts to create a utopia because he found so much satisfaction in running the school. At JRC, Matthew was free to use his behaviorist methods, such as aversives and aversion therapy, in order to control and shape his students' behavior. Aversives are stimuli that are designed to elicit an unpleasant or negative response in a person. Electric shocks, loud noise, and physical discomfort are just a few examples. In behavior modification programs, aversives are frequently used to reduce or eliminate undesirable behavior. An individual with a fear of heights, for example, could be exposed to heights while receiving an electric shock with the goal of associating heights with pain, in turn reducing the fear of heights. Aversion therapy is a type of psychological treatment in which an individual's unwanted behavior or thoughts are associated with an unpleasant or painful stimulus in order to change them. The theory behind aversion therapy is that the person will learn to avoid the undesirable or painful stimulus simply by avoiding the unwanted behavior or thoughts. Aversion therapy is frequently combined with aversives. For instance, an alcoholic might be shocked every time they take a sip of alcohol. With the goal of associating alcohol with pain, and reducing or eliminating their addiction. One method to control a person's behavior is the Self-Injurious Behavior Inhibiting System, or CIBIS. It's a contentious device that administers electric shocks to the skin in order to discourage self-harming behavior. The CIBIS delivers a skin shock, only briefly, lasting 0.2 seconds. 
The JRC used the SIBIS on 29 students between 1988 and 1990, but the shock was not always strong enough to induce compliance. According to Matthew, one student was shocked by the SIBIS over 5,000 times in a single day without producing the desired behavioral change. Human Technologies The manufacturer of the SIBIS was asked by Matthew to create a device that delivered stronger shocks, but they refused. So Matthew then took it upon himself to design the GED-1, which could deliver a much more powerful shock than the SIBIS, and one that would last 10 times as long. Without question, the GED is one of the most controversial methods used at the JRC. The GED could be controlled with a remote and was exclusively to punish students for misbehavior. The shocks are delivered by electrodes attached to the person's skin, and their intensity and duration can be adjusted to the operator's satisfaction. The GED was intended simply to replace older forms of punishment like spanking, pinching, and muscle squeezes. Even so, the JRC continued the use of restraints, sensory deprivation, and even withholding food. Believe it or not, the GED was submitted to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, who approved the GED-1 for treatment of self-harming behavior because it was substantially equivalent to the SIBIS, which is true. The problem was when Matthew took the idea and ran with it, and he developed the GED-3A and the GED-4, which were far more powerful than the GED-1 ever was. Just to put this into perspective, the first version produced a 30 milliamp shock that lasted for two seconds. The GED-4 provided 90 milliamps for two seconds. A cattle prod uses about 10 milliamps for a fraction of a second. Currents greater than 75 milliamps can cause ventricular fibrillation, which is a very rapid and ineffective heartbeat. This condition will cause death in just minutes unless a special device called a defibrillator is used to save the victim. In fact, currents between 50 and 150 milliamps can cause extremely painful shocks, respiratory arrest, and severe muscle contractions. In short, death is possible at these levels. Matthew stated that he designed the more powerful devices because some students had adapted to the GED-1. In arguably one of the most catastrophic clerical errors of all time, the FDA would incorrectly inform the JRC in the year 2000 that it qualified for exemption from GED-3A and GED-4 registration. When the FDA discovered this error a mere 11 years later in 2011, the damage had already been done. They promptly notified the JRC that those devices were not approved for use and ordered them to cease any operations using them. But Matthew worked very hard over the years and simply loved the responses that he achieved with these powerful shocking devices. And he refused to stop using them until they were banned only nine years later in 2020. The GED 3A and 4 were the only versions of the GED in use at the time of the ban quite simply because they were able to shock their victims into doing anything that Matthew wanted. Once it was discovered that the Judge Rottenberg Center was using the GED, it was quite controversial and widely criticized. According to the center, the GED was only used as a last resort after positive behavioral support had failed to prevent aggressive or self-injurious behavior. But that was flat out untrue. According to a 2006 report by the New York State Education Department, there was no significant positive behavioral support program at the JRC, and the GED was frequently used for minor infractions. People were being effectively electrocuted for being untidy, wrapping their foot around the leg of a chair, stopping work for more than 10 seconds, closing one's eyes for more than five seconds, using the bathroom without permission, urinating on oneself after being refused the right to use the bathroom, screaming while being shocked, and attempting to remove the GED. Moreover, the report discovered that the GED could be programmed to deliver automated skin shocks in response to specific behaviors. Some students, for example, were made to sit on GED seats that automatically administered skin shocks for the target behavior of standing up, while others were made to wear waist holsters that automatically administered skin shocks if the student pulled a hand out of the holster. 
shocks were administered indefinitely until the target behavior completely stopped. Again, the JRC only had accidental approval by the FDA at this time. GEDs were discovered to malfunction and deliver repeated shocks until they were removed, and staff even occasionally activated them by accident. Moreover, residents were forced to wear the GED at all times, including during showers and sleep, and they were frequently shocked for minor infractions like incontinence or tensing up while sleeping. Residents experienced extreme insomnia, depression, fear, and aggression as a result of their fear of these shocks. It was also discovered that some parents and guardians were pressured into consenting to have their child placed on the GED, that they were not given accurate information about the device's risks, and that other options were not exhausted before resorting to the GED. This device caused physical and psychological harm, such as pain, burns, tissue damage, depression, fear, and aggression, according to the JRC. It was concluded that the device may have caused one resident to go completely paralyzed and that it can, in some cases, exacerbate the behaviors that it claims to treat. In a deplorable example of the JRC's practices, a 2011 video was uncovered which showed a boy with autism being tied to a four-point board and shocked 31 times at the highest amperage setting. The first shock was administered for failing to remove his coat when asked, and the subsequent 30 shocks were administered for screaming and tensing up while being shocked. The boy was later admitted to the hospital with third-degree burns and acute stress disorder. There was no action taken against any of the employees because neither the law nor JRC policy had been broken. Another instance occurred when two residents were awoken from their beds in the middle of the night, restrained, and shocked 29 and 77 times, respectively, due to false allegations of misbehavior. The JRC founder, Matthew Israel, was indicted on criminal charges for ordering the destruction of the video incident and was forced to resign as part of a plea deal to avoid prosecution. In addition to the GED, JRC had a contingent food program in which a resident's food was withheld, only to be given as a reward later for good behavior. If a resident did not meet all of JRC's mealtime goals, they were forced to throw away the extra food they had not earned. If a resident did not meet their daily minimum calorie intake, they were punished with non-preferred makeup food. JRC also used sensory deprivation as a form of punishment, requiring residents to wear a helmet that restricted their vision and hearing for extended periods of time. During this punishment, these residents were frequently restrained and subjected to other aversives. One resident was subjected to isolation deprivation, a procedure in which he was restrained by the wrists and ankles for 24 hours, and boxes were stacked to prevent him from seeing anything in the room. During this time, he could only eat lettuce with mayonnaise. He was not allowed to use the restroom on some occasions and was forced to soil his pants. Staff were instructed to pinch his feet once per hour and spray him with water whenever they passed. Long-term restraints are yet another controversial practice at JRC. Many of the residents were required to carry their restraint bags, which contained the materials needed to restrain them. The four-point board, as mentioned earlier, and the five-point restraint chair were two commonly used restraints. In the five-point chair, you'd be strapped to a chair at the arms and legs and a hood pulled over your head. The restraints were not used as a lone treatment exclusively, but also in conjunction with other aversives to inflict harm on residents. One resident's behavior plan, for example, stated that he would receive five GED shocks while restrained to a four-point board as a punishment for pulling the fire alarm. In addition to punishments, JRC also had reward programs. Despite the center's claims, state reports reveal that its reward programs were minimal, or simply the rewards were degrading. Such rewards were limited to verbal praise, the ability to look out of a window, and occasionally food. A resident could earn the opportunity to visit the big reward store, which had a pool table and various arcade games, and it was the only place in the center where residents could freely socialize. All of these practices resulted in a number of deaths over the years. Robert Cooper, age 25, died of a hemorrhagic bowel obstruction in 1980. The hospital was accused of driving him to the hospital in a private vehicle, rather than dispatching an ambulance. 
Danny Aswad, a 14-year-old autistic boy, died in 1981 while restrained face down to a bed. At the time, the institute was not permitted to use restraints on its residents, and Danny had previously had a rod surgically implanted in his back in order to treat a degenerative back disease caused by his treatment there. Vincent Militish, a 22-year-old autistic man, died at the institute in 1985. Vincent was restrained and forced to wear a sensory deprivation helmet that emitted white noise, and he died of asphyxiation following an epileptic seizure. Vincent had a history of epileptic seizures and had been made to wear the helmet as punishment for making inappropriate sounds. The judge who presided over Vincent's death's hearing ruled that the staff doctors were negligent in approving the therapy, and that the center's director, Matthew Israel, was negligent in authorizing the use of the helmet. Vincent's mother stated that she did not want the institute to face charges, but she did sue the JRC for $10 million. Linda Cornelison a 19-year-old nonverbal and intellectually disabled resident, died in 1990 as a result of complications from a ruptured bowel. Cornelison was on a contingent food program at the time of her death, where food was withheld as a punishment for undesirable behavior. Cornelison's expressions of pain were misinterpreted as misbehavior by staff in the days leading up to her death. She was administered 56 physical aversives for five hours before calling an ambulance. When the ambulance arrived, Cornelison was unconscious. The Massachusetts Department of Mental Retardation investigated Cornelison's death, and they found that the treatment was inhumane beyond all reason, and it violated universal standards of human decency. But there was somehow insufficient evidence to link the JRC to Cornelison's death. However, a Massachusetts court ruled in 1995 that the JRC was negligent. Even though the court ruled them negligent, JRC continued their evil methods. Andre McCollins, a teenager with autism from New York City, was restrained on a four-point board and shocked 31 times over the course of seven hours in 2002. The first shock was administered because he refused to remove his coat when he was asked. Subsequent shocks were administered as punishments for screaming and tensing up while being shocked. In a video that was uncovered, McCollins can be heard shouting, Someone! Please help me. The JRC staff classified this as major disruptive disorder, for which he received an additional GED shock. Andre's mother had to drive him to the hospital the next day because he couldn't speak and he had burns all over his body. The doctor diagnosed him with acute stress disorder, which was caused by the aversives at the center. His mother subsequently claimed that there is no counseling for the residents there, and the staff there lied to her all these years. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture has condemned the JRC's use of the GED, as have human rights and disability rights organizations. The GED has been banned in several countries, and it was to be the third device ever banned by the FDA, only after prosthetic hair fibers. Despite the bans and condemnation, Matthew Israel defends the GED, claiming it was safe and effective, and that it was supported by science. Matthew insists that the GED was required to assist JRC students who had not responded to other forms of therapy. Many experts disagree with Israel's claims, and rightly so. And they argue that the GED has no place in modern education or the treatment of people with disabilities. I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say it's about darn time that it was banned. It's a pity that all of this happened because of one man's sick and twisted desires to see a utopia designed around controlling people and an accidental exemption by the FDA. It's quite shocking and disturbing really what all of these companies and entities are capable of. If you haven't yet seen these videos, check them out now. I'll see you there.